This one's called Appalachian Apologia. He worked the mines. He spent two years in the army. Part of it in Korea. And Korea, he figured, was colder than Kentucky. And after the war, he returned home but did not stay. His people told him of big money up north, near Chicago. He took a job in the steel mill and was placed in the coal handling section of the coke plant. Good job for a hillbilly. And he figured it was not so cold as Korea, but top of Coal Bridge on an East Chicago January date, it was colder than Kentucky. And the coke plant was a pistol, and it would hurt you if you let it. Same as Kentucky or Korea. He was an old timer when I come in, and he reminded me vaguely of the character actor Ben Johnson of the Westerns. His voice and his face vaguely like Ben Johnson. His hair was snow white. His hair was not always white. There was, there was a day when it was black as coal. Woody and Amel told me so. And he had a set of black, black market false teeth, and, and they clacked, and, and he was proud of the teeth. And he was the first man I met at the coke plant because he showed up for work an hour early every day. And we sat and stared at each other, and he said, This here place is a pistol. He was a white man, American-born, who could not read or write yet. He'd pick up a stray newspaper and and peruse it thoroughly in the presence of the new hires. And Woody and Amel would stare over the coffee mugs and and shake their heads silently. He told lies. He told ridiculous whoppers. And it was kind of funny and kind of sad because he was so ignorant and he thought we believed him. But if you did dispute one of his tales, he'd get riled. He was an ignorant hillbilly. He was a liar. Most days you could only see the whites of his eyes and his false teeth. The coke plant, like a coal mine, was filthy. He smoked humps, non-filbers, and when he couldn't smoke for fear of fire explosion, he chewed plug tobacco, bloodhound, brown's mule, or, or day's work mostly. And sometimes he'd bring back corn liquor from the state of Kentucky, but I never saw him drunk. And he was the last man to wear a respirator when the government finally enforced it. And he washed his tools in benzene, a byproduct of the coke plant, and he didn't wear gloves while he washed the tools. And he ripped asbestos insulation from pipelines so he could demo them with his torch, and he preferred a number six tip in the torch. He used it like a bazooka. He ate head cheese at lunchtime, and the white bread of his sandwich would be black from his alligator hand. He showered faster than anyone I'd ever seen it. And he rubbed powdered hand soap all over his body and he used it for, for shampoo on his white hair. Hand soap was free. He was uncivilized uncir- and he was uncircumcised. <laughs> and even in his later years, the old boar head remained a grunt out in the field. He was plagued with hernias and a bad back, telltale signs of a bulwark. And a chunk of his arm was missing the size of a woman's fist from where he got a caught between a conveyor belt and an island. No dead man switches in those days. With hands like emery cloth, he'd pick up chunks of smoldering coke and, and light a cigarette with them if he thought he was watching. And I watched him bring a small sledge down upon his hand with everything he had yet continue hammering on a cold chisel as if it hadn't happened because I was watching. He was a show-off and he was unsafe. And he worked in the mill with those that was different than Kentuckians. Men and eventually women of all shades and colors that, that spoke with all kinds of accents. But he lived in a hillbilly part of the city. And his sons took dope and sold dope and stole cars. And, and his daughter dressed like a harlot and wore occasional black eye because she went out with boys like her brothers. And she had babies and the old man turned 65 in the mill at, he raised grandchildren in his modest slab home in, in Black Oak, Indiana, USA. And Woody was visibly shaken. He nodded toward a corner in the change house. Woody could only whisper the first name of his old workmate. And the old man lay on the floor next to the toilet, his face a bluish gray like a buffalo carp. And, and on the stall wall surrounding the toilet, Someone had carved, Jesus Mendez can kiss my fucking ass. And someone else let us know that Jesus Christ is Lord in magic marker black. As more of us showed up we, for work, we picked the old man up and 
and carried him down the stairs because the ambulance driver needed help, except for Woody. As we neared the ambulance, I thought of how the old man had pronounced such words as, as ambulance and, and siren and, and how he sounded like Ben Johnson, vaguely. And just before they shut the doors of the ambulance, I touched his hand and, and it felt like amber. And one of the bosses said if we didn't get back on the job, he'd dock us. Woody didn't care because he was visibly shaken. And management said the old man died at St. Cat's, so his wife would only collect half the insurance. And we passed the hat, and I gave $20 for the widow. And I washed the hands of it like pipe. How can I help old woman trying to raise grandchildren in, in the hillbilly part of the city? And he was at a common herd, and he was unlettered and unkempt, and for the most part unwept. When his time come, it was nothing so horrendous or glorious as being blown up or burned up. When I hear millionaire ball players whine or, or think of St. Jude in lost causes, I think of him vaguely. He were a good man. And he never retired. He wasn't died on shit.